Hey all it's good to be back with you again in this video we're going to take a look at chapter 8. Once again this is for our uh, class on creating learning environments or thinking about classroom management. This video is going to talk about what happens if and when students are disruptive. What happens when we have disruptive behaviors in the classroom? At the end of this video we'll get into some of the laws um, that you need to be aware of. So this be a, a pretty long video. I apologize now, but a lot of important content that we want to include herein. Um, so a couple different things. One, we're going to define and talk about what does disruptive behavior mean. We're going to think about teacher self-efficacy involved in uh, reactions to responses to disruptive behavior. We're going to talk about some of the decisions that you need to make about intervention. Uh, think about that sliding scale from nonverbal to verbal. Um, and then we're going to talk about some of the policies and laws and regulations and teacher professionalism that go along with this. So there's going to be a, a wide variety of uh, topics basically talking about how we interact with students and make sure that we are professional at all times. So we talk about which is a disruptive behavior. A, a student interrupts class to ask permission to go to the bathroom. B, a student eats a candy bar during class. C, a student refuses to wear a jacket during recess. D, the student laughs at the answers given by other students. So generally, we have a sliding scale on what we define to be uh, disruptive behaviors. G uh, for the most part, a disruptive behavior is something that interferes with teaching. Um, it interferes with others' right to learn. It is psychologically and or physically unsafe. It leads to an unsafe environment. And then lastly, dis uh, disruptive behavior might be something that destroys property. Um, so we're thinking about interfering with your teaching, interfering with learning, or the, uh, the rights of others to learn is generally conducive or adds to an unsafe environment psychologically and or physically, and we see destruction of property, or we see a destruction of property. Obviously, it doesn't have to be all four of these things. So... Um, one of the things that we understand is if it's not included in that, if we're not interrupting teaching, if we're not interrupting the right of others to learn, um, if we're not dealing with a safety issue, if we're not dealing with destru destruction of property, then what are the other things there? Um, and so one of the things that we need to first think about is what else could this be if it's not student disruption or disruptive behavior? Um, one, it might be an issue with motivation. Um, this might be the student just doesn't want to participate, um, so they act out. Uh, maybe they don't care, so they act out. That's one of the things that we have to consider. This might be a uh, personal issue, an interpersonal or an intrapersonal issue. Um, they might be having a tough time at home. They might be dealing with a lot of stress uh, outside of school or with friends or family. And so as the teacher... We want to think about how might we deal with this situation. We've talked about this in the past as well, thinking about classroom culture and climate. The student might be bored. Um, we see uh, classroom disruptive behavior often happens when you have a student that is uh, doing a great job. Uh, they get done the work ahead of time. And as they complete their work, they're looking for other things to do. And you say, just sit there and wait. And after a couple times of this, the student is basically just going to want to act out to get attention or do something. Um, and so we need to identify ways to differentiate instruction, differentiate assessment, and have that bag of tricks of like extra stuff for your students to complete. One of the other things that we need to think about is what happens when the teacher is the uh, disruption. Um, this might be when the teacher... Uh, intervenes or gets in way when there's not a disciplinary problem. I've seen this in the past where um, a teacher will uh, sort of interject themselves into a situation and escalate the situation uh, for some reason. Um, there might be a situation where the teacher does not intervene 
where there's a disciplinary problem. Uh, I've seen many situations where there is a verbal or physical altercation, many situations where um, there is, this is a textbook definition of student dis disruptive behavior as we detailed a couple slides ago, and the teacher does not get involved. And then we also see situations where the teacher is more disruptive to the learning of others than the student's behavior. So they make it more of an example of, uh, you know, they, they, they are the ones that attract more of the attention than, than the actual students. Um, there are specific examples in here that you can click through and review uh, to get a general sense of some of these problematic behaviors. One of the things that we need to consider is that with some of our students, punishment might be uh, not really helping solve si the situation. A lot of our a lot of our learners, a lot of our students are already excessively punished. Um, those that are show greater aggression. They show less engagement in the learning process. They uh, take blame and they project it out on others, and generally have a negative view of school, if not the world. And so we see this in students that are regularly excessively punished, um, that this is already casting a negative uh, view on or a negative lens on their perspective on the world. If we think about student-teacher interactions, one of the things we have to see is, is there a, a regular pattern of this? So if you have a little bit of disruptive behavior, over time, you might see a negative uh, relationship occur. So you have that one student that is just always the problem child, always causing a situation, always disruptive, so much so that when you're, you're starting class, you see that learner and you're just like, oh, I'm already in a bad mood. Um, we have to think about how that, that student is exhibiting the misbehavior um, showing the disruptive behavior, and then what is your response? And then we have to question, is a student giving those behaviors because um, the student wants to see that response from you? Um, and we have to think about the, the cause and effect. Um, over time, the teacher begins in this situation to respond more harshly. So when you have that student that is frequently the misbehavior and you are responding, then the student comes in, you're, you know, you automatically anticipate this is going to be a problem. You automatically assume the worst, but then also at the same time, you generally don't see positive things that the student's doing. You only look for the negatives and you only look for that student to once again uh, be a disruption in the class. So we're seeing a self-fulfilling prophecy. You had this expectation that the student is not going to uh, be a valuable integral part of the class, a positive part of the class. So you expect that they will be a problem. Um, and then the student is a problem. Uh, students can model poor behavior by learning it from others. So then this bleeds out into other students in the class and they also want to act out. Um, and now the problem really has metastasized. Now we see it's not just one student that's a problem, it's multiple students that are also uh, engaging in disruptive behavior, and now you have a bigger issue to deal with in your classroom. One of the challenges that we have in classroom management is some of us have this fear or concern about disruptive behavior. Um, there is a certain amount of teacher self-efficacy that is your belief in your ability to be effective. There's a certain amount of power involved in teaching and learning. So your competence, your belief in yourself can be, and many times is negatively impacted by these interactions. You view this as an affront to you and your job and your role and your status and your power in the classroom. Um, and so you, um, try to figure out ways to address the situation. If your self-efficacy is negatively impacted, this is going to impact the way you plan, the way you organize, your sensitivity to new ideas, um, your persistence when you deal with adversity, because we all deal with adversity, um, and you're less critical of students because you don't want to uh, be critical 
because then you once again might run the threat of a student being disruptive and acting out. If we also think about teacher self-efficacy uh, in relation to disruptive behavior, if we have uh, a negative uh, movement in self-efficacy, if we have lower self-efficacy because of poor, uh, because of disruptive student behavior, um, you're going to lose confidence in your ability. Um, and then you become more tense and more stressed uh, as you have more interactions with students because you're just waiting for the next student to be disruptive. You're waiting for the next situation where you have a student that's acting out or destroying property or stuff like that. Um, there are ways to increase teacher self-efficacy. And so one of the challenges is when you're dealing with disruptive behaviors, you focus on those disruptive behaviors. You can't take yourself out of your skin and move yourself out of your identity and role in the environment and try and think about different ways um, to deal with a situation. You can't see how you might be part of the problem. Um, and so one of the ways to deal with this is to bring in a colleague, someone else that will watch what's happening or um, go watch the student in another classroom and see how the teacher deals with the student in another classroom. Um, so vicarious learning and and serving as an observer or having someone observe you, someone that you trust um, can be very helpful. Uh, because then you sort of see how the child, the learner, interacts in a different situation. Um, but then you also might be able to use um, some social learning. You might be able to talk to colleagues and get some constructive feedback on different ways to deal with the situation. Um, sometimes you can go to an administrator or a vice principal and ask for feedback on how to deal with this or talk to a coach or a colleague and say, I'm having this struggle. How might I deal with this a little bit differently than I am now? Some of the challenge with this is that this impacts teacher turnover. This impacts our teacher shortage, our teacher exodus, and we think about attrition um, in the field. We see that 40% of our undergrad education majors never enter the classroom because of concerns about disruptive behavior. Uh, we see uh, about 16%, and this is as of 2011 data, um, so this is uh, a bit different now. We see about 16% of teachers leaving the field every year, uh, almost half leave within five years, 9% uh, leave before completing the first year. Uh, last year, uh, 6,500 teachers left their teaching position, and then we see retirement impacting another almost quarter of the population. And the truth of the matter is, it, yes, in education, as valuable as it is, um, as much of a resource as it is for the country, for the globe, um, yes, here in the U.S., we see low pay, we see high stress, and we have to deal with disciplinary issues. Um and so with all of that, we have to figure out ways to better support you in your classroom so that you can feel like you are making a difference. One of the things that we need to think about is uh, specific behavioral interventions that you will have when you deal with student disruptions. One of the things that we want to do initially is redirect the student to an appropriate behavior. If we've been paying attention over the last couple of chapters, we have focused on rules and protocols and strategies and consequences. We generally create a system where we say, this is how our class operates. This is the culture and the community that we've built up. You, at the beginning of the year, indicated you wanted to be part of this culture and this community. Your behaviors now are disruptive. They are not what we want in this classroom. The appropriate behavior would be to, and you detail explicitly what they should be doing as opposed to what they are doing. We also want to try and minimize disruptions to the general process of learning. It is often a challenge to teach and you have one or two students that are being disruptive. Some of the challenge therein is, and I've done this many times, you focus on the one or two students 
and you ignore the 20 other students that are on task and doing what you want. And so instead of focusing on the other learners that want to be there and be part of that community, you spend all of your focus, even if you don't say anything, you focus on those one or two uh, disruptive students instead of the generalized other. One of the things in uh, behavioral intervention that we also want to do is we want to think about self-regulation. We need to provide opportunities for our learners, pre-K up through 12, possibly even higher ed, to think about self-regulation, to think about how do they help uh, themselves survive and perhaps succeed in life uh, on their own. So there's different ways to handle this. We want to think of a hierarchy. We want to think about most of the work that we should do should be a proactive intervention. Um, and then perhaps we get into nonverbal interventions. And then the, the last uh, case, the last intervention might be something that is verbal. Um, so we'll look at what some of this might look like. So in terms of proactive intervention, we see those teachers that sort of are with it. We see those teachers that always know what's happening. They sort of have eyes in the back of their heads. And as, for the most part, you generally have your finger on the pulse of the classroom. You know what students will need. You know what students will have concerns with. You feel when things um, are not going the way that they should. You know parts of your content and curriculum that students will struggle with, okay? Uh, so you know that a certain unit might be hard or some of the workflow might be hard or this time of year might be hard because of state tests and other things. So you generally anticipate the needs of your students and you head off or you try to prepare for potential problems. This could be making sure that your room is well maintained and it's neat and orderly. You might uh, regularly scan the room during lessons and downtime. Uh, one of the a uh, key teacher tricks is to uh, sit at one side of the room and help a student and you're paying attention to that student, but you're really using that as a time to look across the room and look at that other disruptive student and figure out what they're doing. Um, that's a trick that I regularly use. I'd help a student, but be paying attention three rows over to another student that wasn't exactly doing what I wanted them to do. Um, I would also suggest that we move about regularly as a new teacher, but then also as a, as a you know, seasoned veteran educator, um, we sometimes stay locked into one area. That's why in a lot of our classrooms, I hate the fact that we have a podium um, because you sort of get locked to that. It has a gravitational pull. Move around the room. Um, and try not to pace like you're in a track meet, but basically move um, around the room just in a randomized order. And then during time with a group, as I said before, pay attention elsewhere. Because a lot of times what will happen is when you are working in small groups, I'm going to work with group A. Group F is on the other side of the room and they are misbehaving. They are not doing what they're supposed to do. So if we think about our classroom, one of the things that we often see is, you know, if the front of the classroom is up where this whiteboard is, uh, we have the overhead projector, the teacher's desk. So when we come in for observations, and you can do this on your own, pay attention to where you stand. Where do you walk? So we can see that this teacher here, they may be having a problem with students in the seats 13 and 17 or seats 12 and, and 16. Um, and if we look at this, the teacher is basically walking back and forth, moving around the overhead, circling the teacher's desk. They're coming over to the horseshoe, po possibly to help a student that's working one on one and then coming back. They're really not rotating through these other areas. So one of the things you want to do is make sure your physical presence is in those areas and you're cycling through the room um, to keep the students on their toes to know that you are there. Um, a lot of times one of the best ways to deal with disruptive behaviors is uh, your physical distance from it. So to be proactive, 
one of the things that we want to think about is altering your instructional pace, altering your style. Use a variety of strategies to get your students engaged, try different things at all times, um, adjust the pacing of your class, um, slow down things if needed, uh, switch up the style that you'd use to teach just to develop some sort of uh, perhaps keep students off kilter. You also might want to redirect off task behavior um, by switching seating or building in more formative assessments uh, to keep students a little bit busier. So once again, if we think about a hierarchy of interventions, a uh, sequence of triage or dealing with a uh, disruptive issue or disruptive behavior in the classroom, we begin with proactive interventions. Then we should think about leveling up to nonverbal interventions if this is not working. The hope is that most of our disruptive behaviors we can handle with proactive intervention. Obviously, this is not the case, but we don't want to ignore the proactive interventions. Usually, it does give us an opportunity to uh, help deal with these situations. So when we think about nonverbal interventions, they are less likely to cause disruption to the learning environment. Uh, if we start yelling and start shouting, this is going to disrupt other students. There are ways to deal with a situation that's less likely to cause overall disruption to the learning environment and stop the learning of others. Once again, if the learning stops and you're part of the problem, then you are also the teacher as disruptor. Uh, Nonverbal interventions help minimize confronta confrontation and conflict. Uh, Nonverbal interactions offer the student the chance to self-correct. And then if these fail, you still can level up, you still can move up uh, or back down the hierarchy. So think about nonverbal interventions. There are uh, times that you might ignore the situation. Yes, this seems counter to one of the things that we've read about in the past. This might seem count. This seems counter to some of the things that you might think you would do. But there are plenty of times that I intentionally disregard some disturbances from students. I am paying attention. I know exactly what happened. I know exactly what the student said or did. But there are times that I just I decide not to deal with every single incident, okay? I let some things slide. Obviously, certain, certain things I cannot uh, let slide. You might um, use specific signals. Um, so some teachers will have uh, little cards that they hand out, you know, like a stop card. Some teachers will have uh, behavioral elements of the class. So we might have you know, clothes pins on a, on a, on a string or clothes pins on a sign that talk about positive and or negative behaviors. And so you can just very quietly with not even saying a word, move over and hand the student a stop card or move them down in points or something. Um, so without even saying a word, you can just use a subtle gesture to show the students, no, this is not what we expect. This is not what we do. You might also move closer to the student, um, just as we talked about before. Um, and then last but not least, this works for some teachers, does not work for others. Uh, touch interference, general light physical contact with the students uh, using that sporadically. Obviously, that depends on you and your mindset about touching students. That depends on you and your mindset about, um, you know, whether or not that's appropriate. Different grade levels, it's more appropriate. Other grade levels, it's less appropriate. That's ultimately up to you to decide your comfort level with physical contact of a student. If we move back to the hierarchy of interventions, we deal with that proactive intervention. That's the general daily uh, cadence of the class that's generally just lesson planning and unit planning and your classroom management plan. Your nonverbal intervention is the uh, redirecting students without even using your voice, uh, getting their attentions where intention, attention, whereas verbal intervention obviously is going to step it up. So 
When we think about verbal interventions, first, we should try a nonverbal intervention first. Before you even get there, many times if we immediately go to verbal interventions, we stay there and we never get out. And then students expect that verbal intervention all the time. If you use a verbal intervention, please use it uh, quickly. Get to the point. Indicate exactly what the problem is. Um, you may acknowledge feelings, but the key here is you want to correct the disruptive behavior. You want to correct that address and correct that maladaptive behavior quickly. You want to get to the point. Tara pushed Jenny down while lining up for recess. Tara, I understand you get frustrated when other students get in line first, but in this class, we respect other space and property. So I need you to, what is the correct behavior? And that should be the end of it. Um, we want to try nonverbal first. If we do go verbal, we want to get to the, we want to issue the statement quickly, get to the point, acknowledge what might be happening, acknowledge the feelings of students, acknowledge the feeling of others, and get to the point. So be direct. Tara, take your feet off Jenny's desk, please. There's no reason to beat around the bush, no reason to, why are you doing, just get right to the point. Um, you might, depending on the culture and the, the, the community uh, in your classroom, apply to the need for approval. Tara, do you know how you make Jenny feel when you kick her desk? Uh, you might, you should phrase it positively. If everyone keeps their hands and feet to themselves for the next 30 minutes, we will play a special game this afternoon. Obviously, we don't want to use this if we're begging and bartering for students for uh, positive behavior. But there are times that you have repeatedly asked a student, in this case, Tara, uh, to behave. Tara has the disruptive behavior. Maybe you appeal to the, uh, the will of the group. Um, and you phrase it in a positive manner and you don't go back to uh, attack mode. We think about verbal interventions. Um, sometimes peer reinforcement will help out. This helps the student recognize that their behavior is impacting not just themselves, but the other members of the classroom. Sometimes they will care more about their peers than they do about your opinion and sometimes they will redirect themselves. So Jenny's tables focused on their work and speaking in level two voices. They'll probably be the first to finish and go to the reading circle. So I see, you know, uh, Jenny's tables doing a great job on the work now. They are, uh, you know, following through. They're not copying off other people's papers or they are collaborating or they're taught they're working quietly. They're going to be the first to go to lunch. They're going to be the first that's going to get this, um, you know, reward. Uh, and this will be a positive consequence. There is also an opportunity to get the student's attention if they are being disruptive to call them, call on them to be a part of the class and respond. So insert their name into the lesson or ask a question. During a social studies lesson, you see Tara once again watching Jenny closely and getting ready to start trouble. Say firmly, Tara, tell us, what is the capital of Texas? So bring them right into it. It is a, a subtle way to sort of redirect the power in the classroom. Um, we are getting the students' attention, um, but once again, we're not actively trying to add fuel to the fire. We think about consequences. I definitely understand. I've been there multiple times. Disruptive student behavior uh, is is an affront to you. It it impacts your self-efficacy. One of the things that we need to uh, once again pay attention to are the consequences that we bring into this interaction that might make the situation worse than it already is. Um, students should experience direct consequences from disruptive behavior okay so if you deal with if you if you develop rules and protocols and structures in your classroom and consequences and everyone knows the rules students shouldn't be surprised some will but they shouldn't be surprised when there are consequences for disruptive behavior so give them a choice 
Tara, stop kicking Jenny's chair, or you will lose playtime privileges. The choice is yours. So you decide if if I have to, you know that this behavior is not appropriate. This is the consequence. You continue with the behavior or you have the consequence. Now you have the decision to make. Um, and so then you have the opportunity to, the student has the opportunity to decide how far they want to push this. Um, once again, it is an important time to go back to those rules and consequences and procedures and protocols in your classroom and be ready to identify and apply the consequences. Thinking more about verbal interrupt intervention, um, if the disruptive behavior continues to escalate, use the broken record approach with one final choice given. The first time, looking at the student, Tara, move away from Jenny now. Second time, eye contact and urgency. Tone of voice is very important. Dogs understand tone of voice. Um, humans understand tone. Tara, I said, move away from Jenny right now. Okay. Third time, with eye contact, urgency, physical distance, once again, come up to the student. Tara, if you continue to bother Jenny, I will move your desk to the back wall where you will remain until the end of the month. A little severe, a little harsh. Teacher's having a bad day, but we can understand that this is a very uh, significant event and the teacher's not going to stand for this behavior. The choice is yours. Okay, we want to... Uh, show the student that we have rules, we have procedures, we have consequences. I'm not going to be a pushover in the classroom. We're thinking once again about what is a disruption um, and that we want to uh, not disrupt learning. We want to not disrupt the learning of others. We want to make sure that uh, students are a valuable integral part of the class and that they're not disrupting uh, what we're trying to do in our rooms. Wrapping things up here, we want to remain firm. You are supposed to be in charge. We do not want to be aggressive. Once again, the classroom teacher should not be the one of the points of disruption in the room. I will not ask you again, Tara, versus you have one more time to act a fool before I give you something to cry about. Uh, a subtle difference, we'll say. Um, and also, one of the things to keep in mind is and it's hard at times, you have to follow through. If you have rules, if you have procedures, if there are consequences, you need to follow through. You need to write the student up, whatever the next path is. If it's a, an administrator, a disciplinary referral, communication of the family, revocation of privileges, you have to follow through. If you don't, you don't have a leg to stand on the next time. Most likely there will be a next time, especially if you're not following through. Um, so you want to make sure that you follow through. You want to make sure that students know that there are consequences and that they should take you seriously. So pulling together our thoughts about disruptive behavior. First off, as you develop those classroom rules, procedures, consequences, think about how you're going to be with it. How are you going to prevent misbehavior or think about what are the structures in place so that students know what the expectations are? Second, you want to maintain. You want to make sure that you have that with itness. You want to make sure that you know what's happening in your classroom. You are tuned into the needs of your students. You want to make sure that they know that you're there for them and hopefully they will be there for you. You want to third, and this is hard, take the emotion out of it. This can be very uh, charged. It can make you feel upset. You want to try and take the emotion out of it as much as possible. They, students, feed off your negative energy. They feed off your positive energy. So if you're getting worked up, they will also get worked up. Many of our students, as we've talked about before, already have, uh, they are punished multiple times. So you punishing them one more time isn't a big deal. Um, sometimes the students that regularly are punished and have disciplinary things happening at home, when they come in and you bend a little bit for them and you're more human with them, they don't know what to do. Um, 
you might want to use the broken record approach where we're basically repeating and escalating um, our response. And then also probably most important, use uh, active learning. Create a class, create pedagogy and, and learning environments that are exciting, that are fun, that students want to be there, um, that students don't have the time. Uh, so if they're done quickly, you have extra fun stuff for them to do and they want to come to class. They're excited to see you. That's really one of the best ways to deal with disciplinary problems, that you have an environment that your students want to be there. They want to learn. They want to have fun. They want to, uh, you know, make you happy. They feel happy when they're there. That's really one of the best ways to deal with disruptive behaviors. So a little bit of a pivot. We're going to talk about some of the legal components that we need to be aware of. Um, civil rights law impacts our classrooms. Uh, so Title VI is basically saying that uh, it prohibits discipline based on race, color, national origin in all educational, academic, extracurricular, and after-school activities and programs. Um, so we are not going to make decisions about interventions uh, the hierarchy of interventions and dealing with disruptive behaviors based on the race, color, origin uh, of the individual. We're going to handle behavioral uh, interventions. We're going to, sorry, we're going to handle disruptive interventions uh, the same way across the board. Title IX deals with uh, and it protects uh, sex and gender of students, uh, so we're not going to make decisions or impact students based upon uh, gender. Section 504 is uh, an indication that we are going to not make decisions or handle disruptive behaviors or other educational differences differently uh, based upon disability. Once again, these are uh, when you get into your building, when you get into your school district, you should receive uh, guidance on how the district, how the school handles these laws. Um, you should receive that from your administration or from the district level or the LEA, the local educational agency. Uh, they should give you guidance on how specifically this is addressed um, so that you are in compliance with the law. We also want to look at uh, student demographics, we want to think about in South Carolina, K-12 generally, uh, we want to think about the, um, the, the, the data that we see in terms of disciplinary referrals and suspensions. Uh, we see that 22% of black males have been suspended, 16% uh, American Indian males suspended, 10% Latino males suspended, 16% of males of two or more race, so a lot of intersectionality. Um, have been suspended, whereas 9% of white males have been suspended. So even though we look at those civil rights laws in the previous slide, we should have specific questions about whether or not this is happening in our schools. We should think about whether or not we are uh, having a balanced look at disruptive behavior and management of students and intervention with students across the board or is there a specific racial element in the way that we are uh, dealing with disruptive behavior. We also want to look at the challenges in South Carolina um, as it relates to sex. So uh, in Union County we have an example of a Title IX complaint. Uh, inequitable distribution of funding between female and male athletic teams. Uh, in Dorchester County, recent Title IX complaint, uh, an allegation that the district violated Title IX because transgender students were not given access to the girls' bathroom as a result of transgender status. Keep in mind that we have students in our population that are LGBTQ+. Plus. We have students that are transitioning. We have students that in this world where gender is a fluid construct, um, we need to recognize that, that students, that individuals are protected by civil rights laws and that this has an impact on our classroom. So we are not allowed to, we are not to uh, discriminate 
or make decisions about individuals based upon race, um, sex, um, and disability. We think about what happens when we suspend or expel students from our schools. Generally, um, when a student is suspended, they are not getting the same instructional time that they would have had if they were in your classroom. Uh, we see that this causes a student to not graduate in time, most likely drop out. Um, there is a, a propensity to be suspended again. Uh, they might be repeating grades. Uh, and we, we talk about the school to prison pipeline. Most likely there are opportunities. Most likely we see that they enter the juvenile justice system. Um, so we have to be cognizant of and thoughtful about the ways we discipline students. We need to be uh, thoughtful about the behavioral interventions that we use in our classrooms and the decisions made to suspend or expel students. Um, it drastically negatively impacts our students. So um, we should take this very seriously in terms of schools and communities. We see the school achievement decrease. We see an erosion of trust between the community and school and the educators and the community. Um, and generally, it is a very deleterious effect when we suspend and or expel students. Um, there are numerous situations where there are zero tolerance policies. Um, most of them are, are negative um, and they basically provide situations where we have to acknowledge the fact that a student has done something um, that is disruptive, as we detailed before, that is dangerous, it's a safety issue, it interrupts with the learning of others, and we cannot allow the student back into the general population, into the school. Um, but there are still specific questions that we should have about the age of these individuals, whether or not we are disrupting um, their uh, ability to survive in society or succeed. When we think about suspension, when we think about discipline of general ed students, the General Council for South Carolina uh, indicates that the principal generally has the authority to suspend up to 10 days, uh, not last 10 days if it jeopardizes credit. Um, and then the student, one individual, only has the ability to be suspended for 30 days a year maximum. Um, the principal must, upon suspension, notify parents and guardians of the reason for the suspension and a time and a place to conference within three days of the decision to talk about the reason and rationale for the suspension. The parents are allowed to appeal the decision to a board or a designee. This is guidance from the general counsel for uh, South Carolina DOE. Obviously, uh, different states have different legislation. Obviously, this is something that you want to double and triple check when you go to your building and your placement. Um, you want to make sure that your district is following the guidance from the general counsel. Um, but then at the same time, you want to make sure that you know what the rules and regulations are and that students are protected in this environment. If we move on past uh, into expulsion, expulsion is generally identified as a student being removed for the remainder of the year. The school needs to, leadership in the school need to notify parents in writing of the hearing to discuss uh, the expulsion of the student. If necessary, lawyers can represent the student, call in witnesses, etc. Um, the decision must be rendered within 10 days, and then the parents have the right, the student has the right to appeal to a circuit court in the county. And uh, lastly, the student may reapply the following year and come back to the school, unless, of course, it is uh, a weapons offense. Um, then we have different legis then we have different decisions that are made. 
One of the chief components of this is uh, the focus on gun-free schools. We know that uh, schools have increasingly been dealing with critical incidents. We see uh, use of, uh, we see active shooters um, attacking our schools. And so there is legislation, my opinion, not enough, but another talk for another day. Uh, the Gun-Free School Act basically indicates that the school board must expel for no less than one calendar year a student who brings a firearm to school. So this is, the terminology is must expel. So we're going right to the fullest extent of the law for no less than one year for just bringing a firearm to school. Um, so if this is December, you are automatically out for 365 days. We will see you next December. Um, the superintendent may modify that expulsion on a case-by-case -case basis. The school board may oft, they may refer the student to juvenile justice if they determine that it is necessary. One of the things we will also come into contact with is uh, truancy. Uh, some of our students believe that they don't have to come to school every day. Um, so students ha who have three consecutive or five total unlawful absences must receive an intervention plan. Uh, there are regulations that define what is the difference between a lawful and an unlawful absence. And there are clear procedures there to follow for truant students. Once again, when you get into your buildings, you're going to ask administration, you're going to ask district leaders, you're going to ask colleagues, what are the policies for truancy in the district? What are the policies for truancy in our building? How do we handle this situation? And you want to be clear so that you can direct your students if and when truancy becomes a problem. Um, we also talk about corporal punishment. Um, in our schools, the governing body of each school district may provide corporal punishment for any pupil that it deems just and proper. Uh, obviously, the challenge here is what is that designation of just and proper? Um, so once again, get into your building, talk to administration, talk to school coaches, district coaches, get the specific response and uh, the legal viewpoint of the district and the school on how to deal with truancy and corporal punishment. Know what the rules and regulations are and follow the rules for your school. Reporting of crimes. The current AG says there is no discretion in deciding to report crimes. You are mandatory reporters. Failure to report could subject the administrator and district to liability to pay attorney fees and costs associated with an action to compel compliance with the law. You are to report crimes. You are a mandatory reporter. More on the subject of reporting. School officials are required to report crimes. There we go. School administrators must contact law enforcement immediately upon notice that a person is engaging or has engaged in an activity that may result in injury or serious threat of injury. The person suspecting the abuse must report, cannot delegate this responsibility. No other way to say it other than the way that it is said there. Um, exception. It is a misdemeanor to knowingly make a false report. So one of the challenges there is we want to make sure that we don't knowingly make a false report. So there is the, the challenge. You generally have immunity for reporting, uh, meaning if a student tells you something and you report it and it goes to legal authorities or law enforcement, um, they deal with the situation. If it turns out that it was not real that the student was basically fooling and trying to trick you um, for some uh, to some extent you have immunity for reporting uh, because you don't really know that you were making a false report sexual battery uh, it is unlawful for those affiliated with a public or private school to have sexual relations with a student if the student is 16 or 17 years of age, felony, and upon conviction, 
the adult must be prison for no more than for not more than five years. The Jason Flat Act. Uh, we know that suicide and suicide awareness are uh, big problems in our school. I wish there was a different way to say it, uh, but I'm strained for words now at 50 minutes. Beginning with the 2013-2014 school year, two hours of training in youth suicide awareness and prevention is required for renewal of credentials for middle school or high school educators. This training counts towards your 120 renewal credits. So in a general sense, we need you to be aware of uh, the, the prevalence of suicide in our youth, and we need training in awareness of how to prevent this in our schools. Uh, threats to you, threats to school administrators, school faculty, threatening principals, teachers, etc. Uh, it is unlawful to threaten a public official. Any form of threat is unacceptable. Uh, this could be a written threat, a verbal threat, email, etc. Uh, the penalty is not more than five years uh, or $5,000. So the state of South Carolina, for the most part, takes seriously threats against principals, teachers, etc. Search and seizure. Uh, in prior uh, legal decisions, reasonable suspicion is required for search. You need to have consent before you uh, conduct the search. Um, you need your search cannot extend without parental uh, involvement or some other adult in the room uh, or the consent of the uh, parent or guardian. Um, and random does not mean the same thing as preventative. We also see in our schools sometimes canine searches. Using dogs to sniff out objects does not constitute a search. However, when the dog is sniffing a person, it is a search. Um, strip searches are not allowed under South Carolina law. So with canine searches, uh, sometimes what you'll see is the students will stay in the classroom and drug sniffing or bomb sniffing dogs will go through the hallways when all the students are sheltered in place and they will search for drugs in student lockers and stuff like that. Um, in the state, that technically does not count as a search. However, um, if they bring the dog to sniff a student, that is a search. Um, one of the challenges that we also have now is the impact of social media and social networking um, and texting in our schools with our students. Um, do not text students for non-school related things. Be careful about posting pictures on social media. Do not um, share student information. Do not share student photos on social media. Do not share student names. Uh, you do not want to share the identity, meaning the, the face, the location, the address of the school, the name of the student on social media. That is not your job. That is not your business. Um, you want to use privacy settings on your social networks and texting and other social tools. Um, and once again, we do not want to friend uh, students on social networks and text them for other non-school uh, things. We generally want to be professional and think about the way that we communicate and contact students. Continuing on, when we think about teacher professionalism, do not remain alone with the student in the classroom outside of the regular school day without informing the principal. Let the principal know, I have three students that are staying after today, or I have two students doing some makeup work in my classroom. Let the office know what's happening. Let people know who's in the building and where people are. It is always a school safety issue. When you meet with students, keep the door open. Uh, do not meet with students outside of school for a meal or other social engagements alone. Do not entertain students in your home. When I taught, there were several times that 
parents would want to have you come to their house for a graduation party or some sort of birthday celebration. Um, I have in the past gone to some of these parties. I made sure that I went with a colleague. So if it was a high school graduation, I would go make an appearance. I'd show up with two or three of my colleagues that also taught the student. We stayed for 20 minutes, half hour, and then we congratulated them and we left. Um, so it is okay to have social engagements with your students um, outside of school, but you are not to be the only person there. And it's not a good idea to entertain students in your home. I would find some other place to have these events, have these uh, social encounters. Do not be alone in those situations. Continuing on. Do not transport students in your own vehicle without clearance or allow students to have access to your vehicle. If you go on a field trip, generally there is a school bus, there might be some school, there's some school transportation. If you're transporting students and you are using your vehicle, there are numerous uh, permission forms and liabilities that you need to attend to before you even go. Um, this is even when a student is at school and they, the, they're late and they, the parents aren't there and you want to leave, you're not putting the student in your car and driving them home. Also, in terms of professionalism, do not touch students, do not touch staff in a manner that is that a reasonable person could interpret as inappropriate. My rule of thumb is, I wonder what does my interaction, what does my touching of a student or a staff member or another faculty member, what does it look like to a third party? So if I'm talking to a student or I'm talking to a colleague um, and someone else is in the room and they see me touch that person, what does it look like? If it is the, the, the slightest bit inappropriate, I don't do it. Um, Sometimes a handshake is okay, sometimes a high five or a fist bump is okay. Different teachers have different viewpoints, different individuals have different viewpoints on handshakes, high fives, etc. Um, I know that sometimes a hug uh, is something that we'll see in early childhood elementary. You have to decide what's appropriate for you, what's appropriate for your classroom possibly use my guidance of the other person in the room watching this. And then also you want to be considerate of um, what are the rules and expectations and what is the culture of the school. Um, ask what is appropriate, what is not. Um, I am generally very reticent to have physical contact with a student. Um, anything beyond a handshake um, for some reason, if you teach middle school or high school, especially late elementary, students want to show you all of their fancy handshake, you know, to show that you're, you're, you know, a friend of theirs. I never had a problem with that. Um, but you want to be very thoughtful about what you're doing and not treating um, people differently based upon gender, race, disability, etc. So to wrap things up. I've said this multiple times in this, stay up to date with the laws and regulations that impact your school district. When you get into school, you want to know without a shadow of a doubt, what are the laws, what are the, what are the, what are the regulations, what are the protocols, what are the expectations in that school district, in your school, what are the expectations that you make happen as a member of that community. You also want to keep in mind the impact the effects of deferential treatment and disparate impact on students of color and males. We want to be thoughtful about um, the ways in which we might treat students differently based upon race and gender. When we have doubts or questions about behavior, which you will, when you have doubt, ask a mentor, ask your principal, try and identify what is an appropriate response. Until you absolutely know what that appropriate response is, do not have the response. Uh, make sure that you understand how much latitude you have this. 
if you believe a issue of professionalism occurs, let people know. If you, if something happened and it was a mistake, inform the principal, inform a mentor teacher of any professionalism issues as they arise. With that, we are at an hour, so I will sign off now, um, but I value you, and I'll see you in the next chapter.